Okay, White Blue Tron. Match one. We would like to play first. Our opening hand is pretty good. We have enough lands. We have a Signet for fixing. We got a Muldrifter and a Repeal and a Condescend for early plays and interaction. This is great. Okay, so we're going to lead with the Tranquil Cove and pass the turn. And we will see what our opponent is up to. Turn one island. Delver of Secrets. That is quite a popular turn one play in this format. Let's see, we can play a Signet or a map, or we can try to repeal this Delver. Hmm. I think I'm going to go ahead and attempt to repeal the Delver. We could play a Signet right now, but then our opponent gets to untap, and the next turn we might not get to resolve anything, because turn two is when they start holding open Counterspell or Spell Sutter Sprite. So I think I'm going to pass the turn, and I'm going to try to repeal the Delver. Maybe see what they're going to do with it, if it flips or not. Alright, Delver did not flip. So we're going to go ahead and take the damage. We'll, um, not condescend, we'll not repeal it yet. We can condescend if they cast a 2-drop here. No, but they're not going to do that, so we're going to repeal. And we'll see if they try to counter this. Okay, our opponent has decided to let Delver of Secrets get repealed. So, it's our turn now. We can hold up Condescend, we can play a Seagate Oracle. Hmm. Interesting. So I think I'm going to play an Expedition map. And I'm going to hold up Condescend for one, and if that doesn't work... Spell Stutter Sprite. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and counter this. If we let this resolve, then it counters our Expedition map. So I'm going to Condescend for one, get rid of this Spell Stutter Sprite, and then be able to Scry 2. So we're looking for our missing Tron pieces, but land is also good. But not lands that come into play untapped. So next turn, what do we want to do next turn? We probably want to play Seagate Oracle next turn, in which case we could play this tap land as well. But I really want to dig for Tron pieces. I kind of want to bottom both of these. I think I'm going to do that. All right, we'll put those away. We get an Expedition map, and we pass. So now we get the Expedition map in play. We don't have to deal with the sprite. Delver of Secrets is getting recast. Ooh, tower. Oh, we already have a tower. I thought that was really good, but it's not. Okay. Well, if we play a Seagate Oracle, we can't crack this, so let's go ahead and just play the Signet for now. See if our opponent has any response to the Signet. Okay, our opponent has decided to mana leak our Signet, which is perfectly fine with us. Okay, they got it. So now we're going to pass the turn. We're going to crack Expedition Map and go find either a Power Plant or a Mine, and untap and have 5 mana available for Moldrifter. If they leave up mana for Counterspell, then we probably will play something else, like a Seagate Oracle instead. But we'll have to see what our opponent does first. Opponent is casting Ponder. Let's see whether they shuffle or not. Okay, they chose to shuffle. They did that pretty quickly, so they must know what they're looking for. They're either looking for a counter spell or maybe land. So let's crack this map. Go get a power plant. Or a mine. It makes no difference. Okay. Hmm, another Seagate Oracle. Interesting. So I think I'm actually just going to play the Mold Drifter. And the reason for this is, if I draw another land that's untapped next turn, I can place two Seagate Oracle, which would let me resolve one even through a single counter spell. So I'm going to let my opponent counter this if they can. Okay, they deprive, and they pick a land back up. And we pass. See if Delver flips. He did shuffle with that Ponder. Okay, so Delver hasn't flipped three turns in a row, which is pretty good for us. And they just pass a turn. Okay, so we're going to lead with Seagate Oracle. We have Condescend up for one, but that's not going to be enough to counter a counter spell, unfortunately. I could have also played map, cracked map, played a land, and then played Seagate Oracle. But it turns out this is actually going to be much better for us. So we found our missing Tron piece. So we have six mana. I believe we're just going to pass with Condescend up now. We could also play this map first, but we already have Tron online, and I'd rather have all my mana available for Condescend. Our opponent doesn't do anything on our end step. Let's see if they finally flip Delver. They do not. 
So they could have a pretty empty hand of, of okay, Cloud of Fairies. I'm going to let that happen. That's not very high impact at this point. Our opponent just passes. Okay, that's not bad for us at all. Ooh, Aristic Circle. So we can't cast that yet. We don't have the right colors of mana. So we'll play this map. I'm probably going to crack it right now if he lets it resolve. Playing and cracking a map once you have Tron online is actually mana neutral if you don't already have a land. Because it costs you three to play it and then activate it, and then you can get that three mana back immediately with the Nurse's Tower. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep on building up my mana. That way when I eventually play the Seagate Oracle, I can also cast something afterward. That way you can get explosive turns with this deck where you go Seagate Oracle, pick a Muldrifter, play a Muldrifter, and then play a map as well or something like that. We're going to take one from the Cloud of Fairies in the air. Our opponent is hitting all their land drops and is passing the turn each turn. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go for a Seagate Oracle here. Our opponent might have a counterspell, but we can always condescend it back if we want to. Alright, we have a choice between a Tron land and a Plains. I guess I'll take the Plains, so I can try to resolve this Rhystic Circle. We have another one in our deck, so I'm okay with... Well, actually I take that back. I'm not okay with doing this yet. Because I want to leave up Condescend when I cast my next spell. So I'm going to pass the turn. I could get in with one Seagate Oracle. However, if they deal with the other one and then are able to get in with Delver, I don't really want that because they're definitely the aggro matchup here. So I'm going to play it safe. They reveal a Ponder to Delver of Secrets, and now they're hitting us for four in the air, which is a much, much bigger deal. So we're going to try to re resolve this Rhystic Circle to deal with that. If they have two counter spells for both Rhystic Circle and for our Condescend, we could be in big trouble. Because these four power in the air is going to kill us in short order. Our opponent chose not to shuffle. They play a Spire Golem for free because of Affinity for Islands. I'm not going to counter that because all that really re matters right now is resolving this, this Rhystic Circle. If we can get this resolved, then basically nothing else matters because I don't believe our opponent has any answer for it once it's in play. Some of these lists might play repeals, but I don't think it's common. All right, our opponent has decided to counterspell. We are going to counter back, and we're going to hope that it works. Because if it doesn't work, we're in very big trouble. So I have to do this for five instead of four. That's something a little bit annoying about the Tron lands. You can't get the exact amount of mana you want out of them sometimes, so you have to overpay. If this works, we're going to be in very good shape. We're going to get the Scry 2. We're going to have nine mana to put toward the Rhystic Circle on their next turn. Which can currently prevent all the damage that they would deal. If they play a land, then they could pay seven times, and we could only prevent two things and take one, which is not a big deal at all. But then after we untap the following turn, we'd have enough mana basically for forever. All right. Our opponent has decided to condescend, and they have two fairies, but that won't counter anything. They decided to counter their own counter spell so that I can't scry to. Well, that, that's fine. It also puts another creature into play. So, therefore, they can get through two damage on this next turn. And we'll see if our opponent has a main deck answer to Rhystic Circle. If they don't, then we can prevent all damage they would deal us for the rest of the game. Basically, the calculation that you have to pay attention to whenever you have a Rhystic Circle out is the sum of the number of creatures that they have they can get in for damage, plus the number of lands that they have. So, normally I would only tap a little bit of mana at a time as I'm activating this, but I only have colorless mana in play, so our opponent knows we can't cast anything. So I'm going to activate it. I'm going to tap all the mana at once. Save a little bit of time. Our opponent is going to pay for as much as they can, but we're still going to have some activations remaining. It looks like we're actually going to have four activations remaining because they let off with a, uh, a preordain this turn. So here you see the power of Rhystic Circle in action. Our opponent tried to pay, and they paid for some of it. However, they could not pay for all of it. 
and we still have four activations remaining, even after we cast two spells the previous turn. So we're going to choose each of our opponent's creatures and prevent all damage that they would deal us this turn. And then when we untap, we're going to have even more mana. Okay, and we're still at 13. Perfect. So we have four towers out. So the map is not mana neutral. It costs us a mana to do it. So let's start with the Seagate Oracle. We find a mine. We'll go ahead and play that. Attack. Normally at this point in the game we would crack the map for uh, Remote Isle to cycle it away. But that would only leave us with 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 mana? No, that's plenty of mana. I'm still going to do that. So we'll play this, we'll crack it, we'll go get a cycle land. We won't play it, we'll, we won't cycle it just yet because we might need more mana for Rhystic Circle than I had calculated. Another Spire Golem comes out. So now we need 11 mana each turn for this Rhystic Circle. Oh, I should have cycled that. Well, hmm. All right, let's start by cycling this remote isle. I don't really want to cast Mold Drifter into open mana. I don't need to resolve anything, so I'm going to wait to try to resolve anything and port it until after I draw another counter spell. Our opponent's passing the turn. They're presumably digging for their answer, Touristic Circle, and we're digging for a win condition like an Ulamog's Crusher and a counter spell to back it up. So this might take quite a few turns. They have the advantage in that they have Ponder and Preordain in their deck. And we don't have a Counterspell in hand right now to deal with any of it. A Ninja. Okay, a Hardcast Ninja. That's fine. This uh, has to deal combat damage to draw a card, so it doesn't get around the Rhystic Circle. It's not like when it attacks and isn't blocked or anything like that. And even if it was, we have blockers for it. We're going to play out all of our mana because eventually we're probably going to have a big turn where we cast a Mold Drifter, cast another Mold Drifter cast one or two counter spells and a lot of things in one turn. Our opponent has at most two counter spells at this point. They're playing out their lands, it seems like. So that's good to keep in mind. Our opponent casts a ponder. We'll see if they shuffle. Our opponent chose to shuffle. We drew a journey to nowhere. There's no real reason to use that right now. We have plenty of mana. We have 12, 14, 20, 23, 25 mana, and we only need 14 of that to take care of the board as it stands. So we're 11 mana ahead, which means we could go for one of these things and still have enough mana to prevent damage the following turn, but we'd rather wait for a counter spell, like I said before. Prophetic Prism. I'm going to go ahead and cast this. There's no real reason for our opponent to counter it. So I don't mind casting it before I have a counter spell of my own up. Play a power plant. So that effectively cost us zero mana. So one thing our opponent could do with this ninjutsu is try to ninjutsu the creature in um, after we had already activated Rhystic Circle, but we, we have enough mana to activate it and then activate it again for any ninjutsu creatures. I'm going to cycle this remote isle. I do not want the mana. I'd rather find a business spell. And we find another mine. So now we have four towers, four mines, two power plants in play. Even though we're only about halfway through our deck, we have almost all our Tron lands, and that's due to searching some of them out with maps. I'm going to keep passing. See if our opponent draws a removal for Rhystic Circle before we draw a business spell. They're going to cycle a Cloud of Fairies away. We've already used up two Condescend, so there's only two left in our deck to find. Cycle Prophetic Prism. There's a Crusher. Okay. Our opponent's got five cards in hand. So this is this the repeal? Oh, gush. That's fine. They can draw two cards. I actually have not decked anyone recently with this deck, but if our opponent draws more cards than this, then that could be a potential answer if they can't get out of Rhystic Circle. Okay, I think it's finally time to pull the trigger and start casting spells. Start with the Seagate Oracle, because it's the cheapest. And they're going to let it resolve, okay. A Crusher and a Journey to Nowhere. Hmm. What do I want at this point? Probably just another Crusher. Um... I'm going to try 
for a mole drifter next and see what happens there. Most likely this is going to get countered. I can't keep well on waiting for the two counter spells in my deck any longer. I think our opponent has too many cards in hand. Okay, perfect. So this is basically exactly what we want to see, is this Carvex Torch. So now we still have enough mana to prevent damage next turn. We have the Carvex Torch that as soon as our opponent taps out or doesn't have a counter spell, we're going to be able to launch at their face for lethal. So now we just have to wait. Prophetic Prism, we're going to cycle that. Our opponent is presumably waiting on us to deck, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to be able to get out of this. Our opponent is at seven cards in hand to our six. Okay, so we have 12 plus 8 plus 4. 12 plus 12 is 24, 28, 31 mana. So that's enough to play a Crusher, play a Crusher, but not also play Carvex Torch. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. What's the most damage we can take in the air on one turn? If this flips, we could take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's pretty dangerous. Still, I'm going to go ahead and try one of these crushers. It's presumably going to get countered. I don't want to try two crushers on the same turn because that'll tap me too far out of Rhystic Circle. So I said I had 25 mana, minus 8, I now have 17, which is enough for him paying 9 times plus 8 creatures, which takes care of everything in the air, but not the 2 ninjas, which is fine because I can block those. Additionally, I have 1 blocker in the air, which is the Mole Drifter. Our opponent has decided to counterspell the Ulu Monk's Crusher, which is fine. We're going to pass the turn. And we're going to see if they give us an opportunity to resolve this Caravex Torch before the end of the game. They play a Preordain, and they flip the Delver with that Preordain. Not in that order. Card on bottom, card on top. Another Preordain. So this is probably going to be our turn to go for it. Two cards on bottom, so they're not finding the cards that they need. Potentially counter spells. Okay, so we'll start with a Crusher, see if this resolves. And the Crusher resolved. So now I have the question of what I want to do. I think I'm just going to pass the turn, potentially repealing this Ulamog Crusher if they try to deal with it somehow. That way I can replay it, because I only have so many Crushers in my deck. I have three Crushers, they've countered one, that's the second one. So they're going to snap it. Okay, that's perfectly fine. They're going to buy some time by snapping it back to my hand. I'm not going to repeal in response. Our opponent passes. We're going to try the Crusher again. Our opponent counterspells it this time. Okay. So we're going to let that resolve. We're going to repeal an Insectile Aberration for a single blue mana to try to dig for a counterspell. Or a land. Okay. And we're going to do that again on the other Insectile Aberration. This is also letting us need less mana to use for Rhystic Circle next turn, if we tap out by trying to Torch. Our opponent lets this resolve as well. Then we're going to play a Drifter. Try to see if I can't find these Condescends in my deck. I should have two left. Oh, another Mole Drifter. Okay, I'll play yet another Mole Drifter. I realize that I'm going to deck myself first, but there's no way to force him to deck himself first, I don't believe. I'll play a Signet, why not? And I still have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 mana up, which is enough for 9 pays and 3 things in the air, and I have a ton of blockers on the ground, 3 blockers in the air, so I still have enough mana for Rhystic Circle.
Delver of Secrets recast, that's perfectly fine. Another Delver, that's perfectly fine. A third Delver, that's fine too. Okay. So now... We can Carvex Torch, and they can Counterspell. And then we can Condescend the Counterspell. And... They'll only have two mana left, so they have to have two two mana counters. Let me just double check. I have one condescend. I have two condescend in the yard. So I'm going to start with the crusher. If our opponent counters this, then I think we win the game. All right, perfect. So yeah, I think we've got it now. So we're going to tap a lot, a lot of mana. 18. We're going to cycle to a red using our prophetic prism. And we're going to deal 18 to our opponent. And then they're going to try to counter it, and it's going to cost them two extra. So if they have counter spell, it'll cost four, and then we'll condescend that counter spell and we'll win the game. Deprive. Okay. And we only have to condescend for one, but just to be safe, we'll condescend for a couple extra. Okay. X is three. And this should do it. We are going to scry. We'll put the cap size on top. Prophetic prism on the bottom. I don't think it matters. Perfect. Wow, that was an exciting game. I'm very tense. Okay, so we pulled out of that one by basically letting our opponent cast their Delvers, counter our Ulamog's Crusher, and then not have enough mana left over for the very expensive to counter Carvex Torch and our response. So let's go to sideboard. So as far as I can tell, this deck does not have a great Delver matchup, although it's not horrible. Repeal is nice against flip Delvers, although it is kind of bad versus Snap and um, sometimes Spell Stutter Sprite. I do like the Sun Lances, even though they don't hit the Spire Golems, because they hit basically everything else. The Dispels are good against their counter spells. I don't know if I want to go so far as to bring in two Negates in addition to the Dispels, but... It could be a good idea. So the question is, how good is Negate versus how good is Condescend when I'm on the draw? Obviously, if Tron is online, Condescend is better. But I don't want to always be planning on Tron to be online, because if Tron is online, I'm generally doing okay. I think the Dispels are enough, but I don't want the Negates at this point, because I do want to be able to counter creature spells occasionally. So if I'm bringing these in, I need to take six out. Journey to Nowhere and Oblivion Ring are actually pretty bad as well. If I have a creature of my own, and they have a creature, and they try to, and I try to play Journey to Nowhere, they can snap their own creature in response. And these are not May abilities, so they could force me to exile my own creature with one of these spells. So I'm going to take these out in favor of Sun Lances, still leaving in the two Journeys to get Spire Golems, and the two Dispels over two Condescend. Okay, game two. Our opponent has decided to play first, and they have mulligan to six. If we draw one land, this hand is quite good, because we have a Sun Lance to take out a turn one Delver. We have a Signet, so we can play a turn three Seagate Oracle, even if we don't draw a third land. I think I'm going to keep this hand, even though Caravix Torch is so bad in the opening hand, because I do have that turn two Sun Lance. If our opponent has turn 1 Delver plus turn 2 Counterspell, even after mulling and getting to 6, the Sun Lance is worse. But, or even to turn 2 uh, Spell Stutter Sprite. This hand might be worse than I thought. Maybe I should have mulliganed. I tend to mulligan less than I should, and even though I'm aware of that, I still tend to mulligan less than I should. So, our opponent has kept their 6 card hand. Island Delver. Okay. We play a Tranquil Cove and Pass, our only option. It does not blind flip turn one, so we can be thankful for that. Come on, land. All right, another Delver. Exciting. So we'll play Tower. We can either play a Signet, or we can play a Sun Lance while their guard is down. Hmm. Interesting. I think I'm just going to go ahead and Sun Lance. If that flips and we take 6 next turn because I didn't Sun Lance, it's going to be pretty horrible. 
I could have also played the map too. That was a huge problem. That was a punt. Okay, so I wasn't paying attention I, to the new spell that I drew, and I could have played two spells on the turn. I could have played Sunlands plus map, which would have been incredible. Because then next turn, if I don't draw a land, I could have cracked the map and just played a land. And then if our opponent had held up mana for a counter spell, they wouldn't have been able to do anything about us just cracking the map. Oh well, nothing we can do about that now. Taking three. Okay. Signet or map or hold up condescend. Hmm. I think I'm just gonna play the signet. Use our mana efficiently since we used it so inefficiently last turn, and passed the turn, and we're going to keep on taking three from this Delver of Secrets. Cloud of Fury's main phase so that we can't counter it, potentially with a Spell Setter Sprite waiting in the wings, but we will see. Good thing about Seagate Oracle is it costs three, so it gets past Spell Setter Sprite. It does not get past Deprive or Counterspell, so we'll see what happens. Counterspell. Okay. This may be a much quicker game than our game one. Taking four down to ten... We need to find Journey to Nowhere's or Sunlances right now. Okay. Hmm. I think we just have to try to see get Oracle here again. And it gets countered with the Prive. They pick up a land. But then being behind on land doesn't matter because we're not drawing lands either. And they're hitting us for four a turn. We go down to six. We are not long for this world. Prophetic Prism. Hmm. So how can we get out of this? We need to find a, a journey to nowhere right away. Let's start by evoking a Mold Drifter, because we need to find a land and a journey to nowhere. And our opponent gushes in response, potentially looking for a counter spell. That's a rather bold move, going down to zero lands. And a spell stutter sprite. Okay, that's fine, that doesn't counter anything. We're going to draw two, Mold Drifter's going to go away, and we're going to be dead. So we'll go ahead and play this out, but I don't think we have a chance. We're taking five down to one, and then we have to deal with all three of their creatures. Even if we drew a land and a journey to nowhere at once, we could only deal with two of them, so I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, land... Yeah, we're done. Okay. We'll go to get match three. Okay, it's match three. We get to be on the play this game, which is pretty big deal versus Delver of Secrets. And we have another sketchy one-lander. But this time we're on the play instead of the draw, so we're even less likely to get there. We have a journey. We have additional mana, even if we only draw one land. I still don't think this is good enough, though. We're so far away from even casting this calf size. I think we have to mulligan. Alright, we got another two lander. We have a turn two prophism, prophetic prism, turn three Seagate Oracle, and hopefully this will be good enough. Our opponent has kept a 7-card hand, we get to scry. Prophetic Prism, no. We already have one of those. And we will pass the turn. Let's see if our opponent goes 3-for-3 three three on turn 1, Delver. No! Excellent! Alright, so now we get to play a Prism. Try to keep hitting our land drops. A map. Well, I'm happy to have one map, but I wish the other one was a land. Turn two Delver. Okay, so we're going to filter this colorless into a white and kill Delver of Secrets. And play a map and pass. Pretty big deal that they played this turn two instead of turn one, because it allowed us to kill it with Sunlance before they had two mana up for counter spells. Hmm, this is interesting. So I could crack this map play a land and play another map and probably get it countered with a sprite or a counter spell. Or I can pass with Condescend, even though I'm unlikely to be able to hit anything with just x equals to 1. 
I'm going to go ahead and pass and try the higher risk option. If our opponent taps out and lets us condescend something that's pretty good for us, our opponent doesn't do anything on our end step, they just play land and pass. Okay, so now we get to crack this map, find another Tron piece, and take our turn. Okay, we're at three lands. Hmm, what to do? So I think I'm going to lead off with a map. See if our opponent wants to deal, do anything about this. A null. That's actually perfectly fine. It's better than Spell Sword or Sprite, because it means we're not taking damage in the air because of it. A null is also good versus our... Um, I'm going to go ahead and just cast this. We don't really have a lot of time. We have to find land drops. Even though it's going to get countered. Okay. We get to get a counter spell out of their hand. Anola is also good versus our Mystic Circle, we have to keep in mind. So they can counter it with just one mana available, even though most of their other counter spells are two mana. So they're gushing, floating two blue mana, trying to find some action since it's turn six, and they have no. Well, now they do. They have a Spire Golem in play. They'll cast a Preordain. And a Delver of Secrets. And they still have two mana up for a Counterspell, if they if they have one. If we just spike a uh, Urza's Mine off the top, we can just play Ulamonk's Crusher. Which will be pretty sweet against anything but a Counterspell. I guess Snap would also be annoying. And our opponent passes the turn. Our draws have been very bad this game. So once again, I'm just going to go for the Seagate Oracle. If they have a counter spell, they have a counter spell, but we kind of have to pretend they don't at this point since we're so far behind. And yet another counter spell, picking up yet another land. So now three of the cards in their hand are lands because of the gush last turn and the deprive just now. So that's good to keep in mind. Preordain. So they have two lands in hand and they're getting to resolve a preordain. Let's see how they scry. Okay, they went top top, which you never want to see your opponent do. We take five, so we're on a four-turn clock. And our opponent passes the turn. So now I think we're going to go with a Signet. See if our opponent lets this resolve, and then we're going to repeal this Delver of Secrets if this works. So we're going to do this right now, float the mana on our main phase. That way if we draw another land, we can play the Signet afterward. And our opponent mana leaks it. Okay. I'm going to actually filter this to a blue and counter this for zero just so that I can scry two. Because this is getting ridiculous. We need to find like a mine, play the crusher, and not have it get countered to really have a shot at this game. And that does not leave us with time to play a condescend as well. Oh, look, there's a mine and a crusher. Well, that was lucky. So we're going to be. Drawing the mine, playing one crusher, and then hoping that resolves. And if that doesn't stick, we'll play the other crusher. And we might, 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 might be able to pull this game out that way. Okay. Here's crusher number one. What can you do about it? Because of this other Spire Golem, the second Ulamog's Crusher is not going to be good enough. I'm pretty sure. Because they're going to hit us down to three here. I'll play a Crusher, and then we just get killed in the air. If this Crusher does not survive. So this Crusher needs to stick around so that I don't have to cast the other Crusher so that I can use Capsize to keep us alive. But even Capsize is not going to do it now. It looks like we're going to have to hope our opponent sacrifices some creatures here when Ulamog's Crusher attacks, instead of the correct play, which would just be to sacrifice lands and take eight. Annihilator triggers on the stack. They are correctly choosing lands and taking the damage. And we die. Let's pass the turn just in case our opponent decides not to attack us for some silly reason. But I think that will be the match. Rather unfortunate. We got kind of mana screwed our last two games. In this, this game, we even mulliganed. But apparently, 
It was not enough. We had a little bit of late land drops, and our opponent was on a Delver deck, and when Delver of Secrets flips on turn 2 or turn 3, it provides a very quick clock. So we were not able to get there in time. Match 1 was incredibly fun, though, so at least we had that. All right, on to match 2.